welcome into episode five, six, episode next of Bring in the Closers. If I would have prepped, I would have known that. Ben Samuels will be glad to point that out repeatedly throughout this episode. Ryan Ray alongside... The undisputed closing champion himself, Ben Samuels. Ben, how's it going? Going well, although according to uh, to LinkedIn, my nose is not looking too good this week. Looks like I got beat up. Oh wait, oh that was you. That, that was me. Yeah, that was that was me. That was me that took the takes the beating. We did get in a review, despite the. We're we're gonna end this thing. Remember how. Um, did you watch, the, is it the Lucy show when you were growing up? Lucy Ball, what was her show called? Oh, I Love Lucy. Uh, I Love Lucy, yes. Did you watch that? Yes, sir. The question for the listeners is, are we like Ru- La Lucy and Ricky, where on on air we have this great chemistry, but off air we don't really talk to each other? That is the real question of the day. Um, and to be honest with you, I'm not sure I know that answer. I do know we did get a five-star review, and so let's talk about that. This is from The Talking Geek, the podcast I most look forward to this year. Well, that's a lofty praise, especially since it's August. Thank you, Talking Geek. When I saw this podcast was going to be a thing, I began monitoring for when it would start and haven't been disappointed. I'm glad you haven't been, certainly has. Thank you, Talking Geek, for your five-star review. We do appreciate those. They do help spread the word. So a rating and review in iTunes goes a long way. Thank you, Talking Geek, for that. Ben, how disappointed have you been? You know, I was just thinking as you were reading that, Ryan, it's going to be pretty incredible the next time like you and I are at a conference and I meet somebody that, you know, that I've, that I've never met before. And so the only thing they have exposure to is just what they hear you say to, about me on the podcast. I, I, want, I just, I'm sitting here wondering, what are these people going to think about, about this, this character that you've painted? Um, I don't know. Any, any thoughts? I mean, I can tell them what they should think. <laughs> if you <told> me that. <laughs> Are you teeing that up for me? It sounds like you're, you're wanting me to put the expectation. I might have, I might have walked into that one. Never mind. <laughs> I didn't hit record this episode, so we are off, off to the right start. Everything yeah. else is gravy, man. Everything yeah, we, gravy. yeah. You can carry the show the rest of the way now. We did have a. I was to say fun, but let me retract that. We had a busy week last week in Midland. A lot of meetings. Saw a lot of people. Which led us to this topic today. No guest, it's Ben and yours truly. Um, Ben, you have prepared some questions, topics, things of concern, maybe for us to go over. But before we do that, slight curveball here. Because as a closer, one of the things you have to have is that pitch that the batter doesn't see coming. And you sent me a video in response to something I said last week. And it was a motivational video that you said that you, you enjoy and you watch. And if you want to, you can share that with listeners. If not, um, I mean, Teletubbies wasn't what I was expecting, but, you know, everyone's got their own deal. Um, and you mentioned that you... Hey, like- don't, don't, don't hit on the Teletubbies. That'll get you fired up if you're in the right mindset. Don't, I mean... <laughs> be careful, Ryan. Okay, okay, okay. But it was a motivational video. It's one I watched right before we got on here. I have seen it before. I haven't seen it in a while. Um... But I, I kind of, I was telling you about, I have a certain motivational tactic that I don't deploy unless I believe it's a super important meeting or something I think will go badly. And just to make sure that I'm not out there, I kind of get this going. Um, so I was just going to ask you about that. You, you said you watched that video. Um, what was the genesis of that for you? And do you actively search for things like that? Or is it just one that's just kind of stuck with you? That one specifically is from actually from a talk that um, a motivational speaker named uh, Eric Thomas gave some number of years ago. Um, and I watched it, uh, you know, again, consistency here. I think I've talked about it on every single podcast, but I watched it first when I was working with uh, vector marketing and doing that, you know, in uh, that portion of sales in my career, um, came across it then and, and uh, you know, just stuck with me uh, for the listeners that, that may be familiar with Eric Thomas or maybe familiar with the video that I'm speaking about already, you, you may already know, but it's titled, How Bad Do You Want It? Um, and, uh, you know, the, the question that what we were talking about was, you know, what, what, like he said, what, you know, what motivates you, what gets you fired up? And uh, you know, that's something, it's about a five or five to seven minute video, something like that. 
um, you know, that I watch that really gets me in the zone. And, and you know, just like Ryan said, you know, I don't employ it very often. It's really, it, you know, it might, you know, in a critical situation where I really need to laser in. I feel like uh, you know, at the level that Ryan and I execute on a daily basis, we we have a certain level of you know of focus, regardless. But this is really to kind of amp it up and take it to the next level. Think you know, kind of an intro song uh, to a closer, which is apropos, huh? Hey, wow, wow! I see how you, I mean, you're on the next level here. And for those who might be wondering, I turn on ACDC Live. You can find it on Spotify. That is my if I got to be in the zone. That is my jam to get it going. The crowd, the music, the guitar, it just comes together for me. Anyways, so thank you for that, Ben. Let's get into... Do, do we want to put that uh, the link to the How Bad Do You Want It video in the show notes? You know, only 45 million people have seen it, which is about a third of this audience. So yeah, we probably should put it in there so folks can can see it. Uh, a large portion of our audience, based upon those numbers, probably haven't, haven't seen that yet. So it can go from 45 million to 45 million and two. You're being really generous there. Really generous. <laughs> okay, so Ben worked tireless. Oh, oh, so I got to ask you this also. Second curveball. I've back-to-back off feed pitches here. I was thinking last night, and I'm curious your thoughts. This is all honesty. Am I the only person who has a love-hate relationship with Sunday night? Like Sunday night for me and is like... It's like the night before Christmas, and I'm like jacked up, the week's ahead, but I can't do anything. I can't go open the presents. I can't go do anything, and so I enjoy Sunday nights, but Sunday night about 9 o'clock, and I was blowing your phone up last night, as you know, because <laughs> I was like just firing. I can't, I can't really do anything, though. No one's working, but, you know, it's like, is that is that, am I the only one that experiences that? And I'm curious the listener's thoughts, but um, what, what are your thoughts on that, Ben? You know, that's something that... Uh... I may not be able to really address directly uh, simply because you know what, what works for me and when may not work for others, but sure. I, I find what, you know, what works for me is I don't keep a, a nine to six or, you know, nine to seven schedule or, you know, certain hours. And so you know, there are times where, you know, I'll work all day Saturday and half day Sunday or, or through the weekend. Um, you know, I'm in a position where, you know, like we've talked about, I'm, I'm single with no kids. And so I have certainly less commitments. And so in order, you know, in answer to your question, no, Sunday night necess- isn't necessarily a launching pad for me, but, but there are definitely times where I have that kind of um, same you know, anticipation of you know, something, something I'm working on, you know, that, that may be coming together in the next day or two or something like that. And it just really want, really wanted to kind of jump at things, but, uh, but not, not in terms of a, on a day-to-day basis or like a certain time of the, of the week necessarily. Uh, yeah. I guess for me, the, the thing is, is I know that once Monday hits, there are so many things that will be happening, but on Sunday night, I can't do anything about it. And so I'm just kind of stuck there waiting for that to happen. So I was just, I was just curious if I, if I was alone in that. Okay. Ben Samuels. First question. How many deals is too many? Or is it, how many deals are too many? It says is. I'm reading the script here. I feel like this is like deal or no deal, or like who wants to be a millionaire? And I was, I, is there a right answer? Can I yes. get a 50? A, one. B, a million. C, 50. D, 327. <laughs> no, you know, it's. <clears throat> I think it really comes down to some of the things that we've talked about on the podcast previously, but you know, what is my role in the deal? You know, if, if my role is talking to people on a daily basis and working the, the process and, and being really the, the day-to-day manager of that deal that, you know, I, I really only have the capacity and, and everyone only has the capacity to take on so many of those. If it's more, you know, relatively hands-off and someone else that I'm working with is going to be doing a lot more of the front load and a lot more of the front work, you know, that, that I can take a lot more of that on. And so I don't know necessarily if it's a quantity thing. I think it's more about, and what I think about is, you know, once you kind of get into it, you know, some people only have the appetite for doing one deal at a time and that's, that's totally fine. And if you're executing, you know, there's nothing wrong with that. Uh, you know, it, you probably have to have a pretty high closing ratio in order for that to make financial sense if you're doing that full time. But if you, this is like a side hustle, then that's absolutely fine. Um, you know, conversely, uh, you know, I could pull it up here, but you know, off the top of my head, I think I, you know, I'll give you a peek behind the curtain here. I think I'm working currently in, in one role or another. I'm working on, it looks like about 41 different deals. Um, and so that gives you a, kind of a sense. And, and you know, do I have the capacity to, to add some other things? Absolutely. And so if there's something that I could strategically fit in there, you know, I, I definitely have the capacity uh, to, uh, to bring stuff on. But at the same time, one of the things that I think you and I 
um, have uh, have kind of talked uh, at length about because I think that we see it very differently is you know when is the right time to say no? What are the what are the qualifications and what are the metrics of that decision? Uh, you know when do you do that? And and also you know I, I think to a degree we've also talked kind of. Um, been at odds in terms of, you know, what is the time value of money in the sense of how much am I willing to put into a deal to get paid on the back end or, or, you know, as, as like we've talked about on think I on episode three as like a relationship builder. Um, so what, what do you think about that? Yeah. I was thinking about th- that this morning in this regard. Um, I, so I want to answer your question, but just, just from your standpoint, would you rather, work on and I, I, I gotta be careful here because i can make the numbers where it's quite obvious but so don't hold me to the numbers but you can understand where i'm going would you rather work on 10 deals a year or let's just say 500 deals a year so you're gonna close you're gonna close you're gonna make the same amount of money uh but you have in, in model a you have to close let's say 10 or 20 and model b you have to close 300 or 400 which would suit your your um your suitability difference because if you think about it from just a, a deal standpoint, depending on what kind of deals you're working on does dictate the volume, right? Cause you could have a deal that's only worth a thousand dollars. Um, and so would you rather have quote unquote, the big ticket type thing, which are harder to close because there's only a smaller pool of people who could buy those. Um, they take longer usually to get through more due diligence, lawyers, things like this. Or would you say, you know what? I'd rather be where there's, um, maybe not the the vast majority of Americans, but there's more people I can actually take these deals to. So my, my sweet spot tends to be on the, on the higher dollar ticket items. You know, it, it seems to, uh, that my, my network and, and my connections are, have an appetite for you know, the, the higher value things. And, and that's not to say that I don't, um, you know, don't see lower value deals and, and can't close those. But you know, like you mentioned, you know, if, if you're looking at, and I'll just, you know, we can talk just general numbers, but I mean, if you're, if you're looking at closing a deal, that the total value is one hundred thousand dollars. You know, as a broker, you know, let's say that you're making five percent. So you're making five, you know, five percent gross, just to make it really easy. Okay, so you're making five thousand dollars in that deal. In order to survive, in order to support a family, I mean, you need to be closing a huge amount of volume of deals just to be able to clear, you know, expenses and, and everything else, right? Whereas, you know, if you're looking at deals that you know the average is five million dollars or, or two million dollars. You know, then you're looking. You know, the the economies of scale change quite a bit, and so you can afford to take. You know, not only do the deals of that size take longer to close, but you can also take longer. You know, you can invest more of your own time and resources because the the upside is that much greater. And so, it really depends. I think it depends on on what your network is. You know, there are a lot of people that I know that they you know you know they thrive on mineral deals in the mineral space. You know, between hundred to five five hundred thousand dollars and there there are some you know very successful firms that, that that's their sweet spot and that's where they stay and so that's not to say that it can't happen but, but like we've said it, you just need to be closing a higher ratio and you need to have an appetite to, but also conversely I think you also need to have an appetite for to review a lot more deals simultaneously because of that because you, you can't afford to have only a few on your plate you need to be reviewing a bunch because because of the, the necessity to close yeah, I think this is a a fascinating topic of discussion because it's not it's not one to one. There is no one right answer here. Um, my dad one time um, had someone in his office and they were struggling with their business and and he just asked them, "What's the fastest way to cash a check?" And I thought that was quite simple and yet brilliant at the same time because sometimes we get lost into the you know, if you're in a bad spot, we get we, we think about, well, if I could go land this mega project or go close this deal or just get in with this right person, everything would be better. But sometimes it's as simple as what's the fastest way to cash a check? Um, what you've been able to do is cultivate over, you know, these years, a uh, extensive network that has. Go ahead. So, so I, I want to, uh, you know, I'd actually like to push back on you on that because because that's something that you and I talked about, and, and I think that we we view it differently. And I think it'd be interested, um, interesting for the listeners to kind of tear into that a little bit. Um, you know, so I think, and and I and I think I even said this to you earlier this week. I think that I'm cognizant of the fact that this is a losing proposition for me long term. I think I I think I know that it loses me money uh, probably pretty consistently. Um, you know, but at the same time, I'm of the opinion. That you know, I will invest more time and resources a lot of times on the front end on a deal, and sometimes I'll 
hold on a little bit longer than I should in the sense that, you know, that there may be times where I could cut bait earlier because it's clear that it's not going to work. But I feel like for the sake of the relationship and I, and I guess at a zoomed out level, you know, what I take for granted or sorry, what I think some people take for granted and what I try to, to be uh, always you know, present with is, you know, if I'm taking someone's time to hear them pitch me a product or pitch me a service or pitch me, you know, idea that they have, you know, that at the, while I'm giving them my time to do that pitch, that also to me means that I'm giving them my commitment that I'm going to at least see this through to some degree to put this in front of the right people and see what I can do. Because so I very rarely, if ever, will listen to an idea and immediately say, listen, I don't think this is going to work because of X, Y, or Z. The only reason I would do that is because if something was a fatal flaw in the idea that I just couldn't represent. But but I think that you and I, we uh, were working we were working on one deal um, over the last few weeks that we you know we kind of saw the the time to cut bait a little bit differently. Um, you know, so without getting specifics about that deal necessarily, I'm curious what you know what, um, kind of how you frame that or what you think. Yeah, well, so on that on that specifically, um, you know. I think one of the things that 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 one of my weaknesses is is I have a tendency to stay in to things too long. Um you know, if, if there's someone I really like, then I'm willing to stay with them too long. And so what I have to do is if there's someone that I don't have any emotional attachment to, I don't know them, I just you know, there's no we're not friends, you know, we haven't worked together. It's just something that gets pitched to me. I try to buffer myself because I know my tendency is to be caught up into something that's not going to work, trying to make it work, knowing it's not going to work, still trying to save it. So on things where there's not as much of an emotional connection, if I don't feel like um, me and that person are on the same path um, and I don't think it's going to work, then, then I'm, I'm more quickly to pull the ripcord because I know my tendency will be is if I do get to a relationship with this person and we're friends or uh, acquaintances, that, I, that, that my tendency is going to be to give the benefit of the doubt as it is. So if it's, if it's somewhere where someone comes to me, I don't know them, they pitch me something and I'm like, eh, okay, well we might can push it for a little bit. But if, if they're not seeing things the same way that I am, then I'm more likely to go ahead and, and stop at the end because I've gotten burned in the past by my own doing where I, um, I sat there and, and it's, it's we came friends with the person and then I'm trying to help them. And I should have known from previous conversations that we didn't see things on the same path. And, it's hard to be in the position where you feel that you're trying to advise someone and they're not taking your advice and then you keep going down that path with them. And so that's kind of my struggle. That's where maybe if I don't know someone, I'm a little bit quicker to pull the trigger. Yeah, that's absolutely fair. That, that's a great point. Um, but to what I was saying a minute ago, let's, let's, unless you got something else on that, well, I'll circle back around. Okay. So on the too many deals things, um, what the point I was getting at is I think – when you look at the volume of deals, obviously the the um, the ticket price, if you will, look at the commission side or, or the fee or the back end or however that's structured, is 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 different. And usually speaking, the higher val uh, higher uh, value of the product being sold or whatever, the more lucrative you can make it. The more ways you can manipulate the deal to be in your favor. So if it's a you know a four hundred million dollar deal that you're working on, you can back in maybe a consulting fee, you know, whatever you can structure it. Wherever it, if it's something that there's only a thousand dollars in the pie, there's only really get the thousand dollars, you know? Um, my caution is, is to come out and say, what I was getting at was you have a very good network and you've worked hard for that network. Um, my caution is to say to people, Hey, don't, don't, um, don't worry about the small things, go for the big things because, people do need cash checks and they do have to live. And so I think part of the thing, if you're looking at how do you balance this is you may say you want to get to where Ben is in the world, but you also have to realize that doing deal flow and keeping deals flowing through your door is important or you won't be able to get to where Ben is. So how do you balance that? Because I mean, you got to remember that, that it's, so it's not, it's not about what, what you're doing is right or wrong. That's not what I'm getting at. What I'm getting at is how do you walk through that mindset where, okay, Ryan has a family of four um, and a wife. Ben doesn't, and that's no judgment on anybody. It's just, it's just the facts. Well, my 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 lifestyle is a little bit different than yours. And and so if someone's hearing this, they go, well, I got two or three kids. Um, is Ben saying I should focus on maybe the more higher ticket items? And to me, I would say, well, if you have that network, 
Maybe so. But if not, you need to figure out how to cash a check by doing deals that are available to you and then work your way to where Ben is. So one of the things that I, I have an identified weakness about myself, and this is probably going to be exposed uh, more and more on this podcast, is that sometimes uh, you know, when I'm framing something, I'm only framing it through the prism that I can only that I can look through because it's hard to look through someone else's, right? And so, to that degree, what I'm what I'm talking about is you know what works for me. So ju- just looking at Ryan and I, Ryan, you and I look at that model very differently. We have a couple of different business proposals that uh, you and I have been talking about putting into action, and we we see the growth trajectory and we see, you know, the, the way to grow those businesses very, very differently. And so that, like you said, this is not a right or wrong at all. Uh, you know, I'm just, uh, you know, I was addressing what, what's worked for me and what's developed in my network, but don't get me wrong. I mean, on the front end, when I was starting to put deals together, I mean, you know, you, you have to start small, right? You start small, you gain a following, you gain people's trust and, and you, you know, you kind of, you build right. your name, you build your brand and you, and you work up that it doesn't, it doesn't happen overnight. And so, you know, sometimes I, I do get caught up in the fact that, you know, you and I have been doing this now for years and years, whereas someone that's listening to this may be looking for like, okay, so, you know, I'm motivated, but I don't know what I'm doing day right. one. And that's a whole different ball game. You know, that's where you're really just trying to, you know, educate yourself in the market, figure out the, you know, the smaller things and then, you know, build from there. Yeah. And, and I think the reason I push back so the, the, the listeners understand is I, I, that's kind of what I know about you. And we don't want to come off, at least I don't want to come off, I don't think Ben does either, as the guy saying, hey, go get on Twitter and send 400 messages to CEOs and then get one cup of coffee and then your life's going to be great and you're going to be able to close things. There, it, there, there's there's trajectories in life and you have to work your way through those. And, and real quick before you come in, one of the things I think that, that for the listeners who said that they want to work through this, if they're, if they're going for low-hanging fruit early, it's a great spot to that's a great place to start. It's called low-hanging fruit for a reason. But also, it, th- there's capacity issues, and there's certain types of deals, being that are probably higher ticket than, than I'm dealing with now, that at some point, I would have to wear suits, and I'd have to wear you know nice shoes, and dress really fancy. And there's probably a certain point for me where I don't even want to go to certain levels because it's not, it's not where I want to be at uh, professionally. So um, you have to balance that out, where you start at, and then you might say you want to be at a certain spot, but as you get there and you start working through these things, you realize, oh, wow, okay, there's certain lifestyle choices I had to make, or, I mean, I'm wearing a fishing shirt for crying out loud right now. You know, it's, that's a lot more my style than the three-piece suit. So, Ryan, I'm curious what you, what you uh, I mean, how you'd address this. So, and, and again, this is probably a decision that, you know, everybody's going to have to make on individually, and so, so I'm only going to talk for myself, um, but you know, the way that I decided to grow my business in both the mineral space and the water and midstream space was I didn't walk in or I didn't try to walk into any door unless I knew that I could bring them direct value that was going to be actionable, it was going to be immediate. And so when you mentioned about, you know, spamming, you know, 400 uh, Twitter you know DMs to, to CEOs, I think that's directly in contrast with with the model that works. I, I think what's important is when, when you decide or, you know, what I have found that works for me is when I decide to take someone's time, I want to make sure that regardless of whether they like what I said, they found whatever I said valuable enough to have not felt like they wasted their time. And I feel like if there's people, if you're trying to, if you're listening to this podcast and you're just getting started, you, know, you can't walk into the CEO's door at, you know, one of the top 10 companies in the Permian, right? That That's not going to happen. But that doesn't mean that you can't find the right person to talk to, whether that be, you know, a lease operator or rig hand or, or you know, uh, you know, mineral owners in the area or, you know, do, you know talk to people at cafes, you know, however you want to build your network, you, you need to kind of build it organically. But the, the point that I really want to hammer home, you know, just because, you know, because of what you mentioned is, like I said, I, I take that, that sense of delivering value really seriously. And I think that that's really what gives you trust at the end of the day, because the next time I call that person, they know that I'm not going to waste their time and they know that I'm not going to pitch them something that's totally, completely out of their fairway. And because I've done enough work to figure out what, you know, where I need to stay. And I think that's really valuable. Um, yeah, no, I, I, I think that that's uh, how you've done things from what I've seen and it's worked very well for you. So no, I, I think that's, um, I think that you're that you're right there, and that's you know I think we'll kind of probably say the same thing a lot. But part of the thing with the show is it's it's not a sales show; it's a deal it's a deal show, and there 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 is a fun, sales as part of this, but it's not 
It's not that, hey, get out there and just wear people out till they, till they actually buy your product. Okay, so we touched on it a second ago about um, pulling the ripcord, and we've talked about that on, on kind of the red flags. Um, we were talking about a specific deal that we're looking at, but um, let's just let's just take it here, repackage this. You know, Ben, if you're sat down on a day, and to say 10 meetings is could be a normal day for you, um, you have 10, 10 meetings, 10 different proposals, um, ranging in value, ranging in time, length, um, potential people you might be inter- uh, interfacing with. How do you weigh those out? Because theoretically, you could have a deal that only nets you $1,000, but it puts you in front of someone that you never would have met before. So you have to take, it can't, money's important, but there's other things at play when you're evaluating these deals. So how do you figure out, okay, these are the four I'm going to work out. You know, I've got 41 I'm working on. I'm going to add four more and cut these six. One of the things that I think is a strength of mine is, you know, and, and I think you and I have talked about it offline quite a bit. I used to play um, quite a bit of poker, um, you know, and I'm, I still play a little bit. Um, one of the things about poker and gambling is, you know, it's this mentality when the chips are in the middle or when, the, when you have chips in front of you, it's no longer money. It just represents, the, uh, you know, units of value and you're trying to accrue, accrue more units of value. The reason I bring up that analogy is because, uh, you know, and it may sound hollow to some of the, to the listeners, but, but it's really, and I think you can probably attest to this because I've pushed back enough, uh, enough times that you probably have seen this between you and I, I, I really don't take into account the dollar value of what the net I'm going to receive on a deal on the front end to that's not that's not one of the things that's in the top of my filter what i mean by that is again i'm really more focused on the relationship and you know what i'm focused on is what are the chances that this can close and how quickly or you know how much value and how much effort is going to take me to close now you know that at a high level is very true you know if there's a deal that is a home run you know that i'm going to net high six you know seven figures on of course, that's going to be more on my radar than others. But in terms of a, a you know kind of a pre vetting process, I really don't focus on the money nearly as much. Um, you know, I'll, I'll take on. You know, I I worked on a, a deal. You know, I met with a woman three different times for a total of about four hours um, over about six weeks. You know, a, a couple months back, and that was for three acres in Martin County. And you know, my, my net to that after we got done was two thousand dollars. And so, you know, so was the, was the eight hours of work, you know, worth $2,000 on a, on a per hour basis? Sure. You know, do, do I generally take on, you know, do I usually take on that much work for, for that small of a net? Probably not. But that's, you know, again, that's a decision that you, you know, you and I and everybody listening has to make individually. Um, and, and, you know, that, that's also going to be you know, commensurate with where you are in the process. So, how would you advise someone who is, you know, um, they're not Ben Samuels, they're, they're, they're novice or uh, intermediate level or, or whatever. And they're, they're trying to say, well, you know, Ben, um, you know, how did you make that transition? Because one of the things like, I, I will say, it, it, you are frustratingly not concerned about the money on the front end. <laughs> Cause there's been several times like, so what are we getting paid on this again? You're like, I don't know. I'm like, well, right. So, <laughs> What are we getting paid on this again? <laughs> and you're like, I, I really don't know. It's like, okay, I'm gonna ask it a third time. <laughs> I get the same answer. Um, but but I, I understand why you do that. I I, I get it. Um, so how how have you been able to you know cultivate a sense of um, okay, you know what? This is a small deal. It's gonna take three four hours. It's only a couple thousand dollars. Um, but it's worth my time. Like, what 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 are the things? Are are you thinking about long term prospects? Are you thinking about you know what? Sometimes um, I haven't done a deal in this county just to make up. I don't know about this case, but just for argument's sake, I haven't done a deal in this space or in this area. You know what? This is a low value deal, but I can get it done, and then it kind of gives me credibility in the space. Um, what are the things that you're looking for as you're trying to evaluate that? So I say it quite a bit, but my role in a lot of these deals optimally in, in a perfect world is for me to make a couple of connections, put people together, put, put the right stakeholders together and step out of the way and facilitate whatever I need to do in the middle. And what I mean by that is, you know, there are times where I'll look at a deal 
that, you know, immediately I think of, okay, so X, Y, and Z would you know, need to hear about this. And so I'll fire off an email or send, you know, or make a phone call to those three people. And, you know, that that's relatively, you know, lo, ro, low workload for me, right? And so I think the value of the relationships that I've built and, the, and, and really my mentality across, you know, around this whole thing is, you know, if you're, if you're the asset owner, you don't want to talk to me because I'm not going to be the one cutting you the check, right? Optimally, you want to talk to the person that's going to be cutting you the check. And vice versa, if you're the person cutting the check, you don't want to talk to me. You want to talk to the person that has the asset. And so in that, in that role, my role in there is just to be the conduit to conversation. And so there are a lot of brokers and there are a lot of deals where the broker takes control of the communication because whether, you know, whether they don't have a great relationship with one, one side or the other, or that's just their process or, or you know, any number of reasons. A lot of times I find that brokers kind of take more upon themselves because they feel like they need to do more because they, you know, they, they want to have control of the asset. Whereas what I'm endeavoring is I want to have enough trust on both sides. And obviously I paper things up when necessary and when appropriate, but I want to have enough trust on both sides that I can put the two parties the, together once the deal is, you know, once the deal is on the financial side is, is negotiated, put them together and then step out of the way. And I think you know, that that kind of builds my, you know, their trust in me on both sides because it's very transparent. And, and a lot of times, you know, I have a standing agreement with the buyer for a fee. And so the fee and, and my cut in the deal it doesn't is not even in part of the conversation because it's already predetermined, and that goes back to what we talked about in episode one, setting the expectations. Yeah, see, I, I like to think of it. Um, one of the things that that really factors in for me is is does this give me a new um, entry point into a certain space or into a certain area or something like that? So, you know, the South Africa stuff, which I've been working on for quite some time, is very important to me because it it allows me to legitimately say I've I'm an international, I've done deals internationally. And on some level, there's a lot of people who have done stuff like that. Um, but, but I see you're shaking your head. No, they can't. but well, but they work for big companies as well. I can say there are a lot of people who work for huge mega corporations who have gone and done stuff internationally on a practical level. But there's, there's few, I would argue that if you execute what we're talking about, if we get this done, I think there's few that would have executed that. I, I, that's yeah. That's where I was going. That's where I was going. So the, what distinguishes myself is that that I've been able to, to go and do this um, uh, apart from having a multi-billion, hundred million dollar corporation behind me. Um, and so there's a lot of pride in that. And 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 when I tell people who deal in the international space, they they can understand and appreciate that. Um, when I think about dealing with the fighters and managing those guys, I enjoy it. Um, my guy Quentin won this weekend, so shout out to him. Um, but. Um, and in a side note, I mentioned this on um, on LinkedIn, but the the president, uh, the CEO of Bare Knuckle Boxing, is going to come on and talk about the deal that he closed. It's going to be, I think, a pretty good story. But anyways, you know, if, if I want to diverge into the sports agency business, I, I'm a legitimate sports agent. I've negotiated sports contracts um, for fighters, and so that opportunity, while it's not making me money, um, I spend more time that I make because I literally not collected any checks at this point for it um, by, by my own choice. But if I want to be in, and I wanted to go to be a sports agent. I have now the platform to do that. Where is if I said, you know what, I'm going to go to the NFL PA or the MLB or, or NBA or whatever and get my certification and then go try to solicit. It, it would be a little harder. This actually gave me the in through someone I knew who believed in me. And so I look at things like that and say, you know what, there's a lot of value. If there's value that can get me into a space or get me in front of people um, that it hasn't before, sometimes that I'm willing to take a lot of risk on. I take, I've take i taken a lot of risk, if you will, as far as time goes with the fighters because it's not, even if I was collecting from these guys because where they're at, they're not making a lot of money, I wouldn't be making a lot of money. But if it's something I really decide I want to build upon, I have the potential to do it, and I've been able to pr- uh, put a little resume out there um, whereas if I wanted to just go cold Turkey and get into that, it would be really hard to, it'd be really hard to do. Absolutely. From a credibility standpoint, absolutely. What, um, what I would be curious on, uh, to hear you talk a little bit more on, on is, you know, I'm very hesitant to branch out into a whole different industry. I'm very hesitant to take on, and, it's, and I'm not talking about deal flow in this sense. I'm, I'm more talking about since you're, what you're talking about is kind of more uh, business you know, development and actually building something in a space. I'm a lot more hesitant to, to do that uh, because, you know, a lot of times it takes, you know, there, there's a learning curve and, and there's, you know, all, all those things. Right. And so unless it's relatively 
similar to something that I have experience in, I'm pretty hesitant to, to jump into something new because I'm always kind of, and concerned isn't the right word, but apprehensive that you know, if this really takes off, it's gonna. I have to. I have to. You know, take care of it, right? Like, if it takes off, I can't just let it die. And so, you know, do I have the ability to let it take off and divert my attention, or is that too far off course with what I already have going on? And so, you know, to the listeners, you know, there's there's kind of this give and take of to to a degree. I think there's a sense of you can have too much success in the sense that if you put your hands in too many things and they all take off at once, mm-hmm. you might be left sw- you know, swimming. And if, if that happens, you know, your ability to deliver value in each of those pies may, you know, may fall away. Yeah, no, that, that's, that's a great point. So <clears throat> I can kind of break down the, the two separate things this for vantage point. The international stuff is a very slow moving wheel that's taken years and different avenues to try to get to. The, the fight stuff is interesting because, um, you know, it was very easy early on to kind of have success in that business, mainly because the types of things that me and you are working on, um, this isn't nearly as complicated. It's not nearly as complicated. And so the accessibility of the, I'm sorry, the accessibility of the players, the promoters to try to get involved with them um, and to figure out what they're looking for is, 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 is actually pretty easy. And I didn't know that going in. It's just, I got the job and started going after it and I found, okay, wow. This, you know, this is a lot easier than what I do a lot, a lot, a lot of times. Now, I've been doing it for probably I guess, two years now, and I found that to grow the business, I mean, you've talked about this offline some, to really grow the business is going to take a substantial probably amount of my time. I'm going to, have to tweak the way, uh, the way I do things and this, that, and the other. So I've got to decide if I want to do that. Um, but, and, and I don't know how to say this, but to say it, but I did find that it's, if you want to put your mind to it, there's a lot of money. <clears throat> there's a lot of money to be made and the entry point is pretty low and there's a lot of ancillary benefits that I think if you can scale that type of thing up, you can actually do. Um, I know you said it's kind of business development and it, it is, but there's also a lot of deals cause you're negotiating contracts. Um, you know, you're trying to sign fighters and negotiate terms with them. So it's, and, and, and when I first got into it, I'll, I'll be honest with you. One of the things I thought of, I had several guys fighting over, <clears throat> over the course of a weekend and I made like four or 500 bucks and I was telling someone about it. And they're like, Oh wow, that's not a lot of money. I said, you know, if I told you I had a rental house and it made 400 bucks this weekend uh, or this month, you would think I'm cash flowing, baby. It's the greatest thing ever. And I got guys who are going out fighting and I'm not, I'm not getting punched or anything. And I made four or 500 bucks. Now four or 500 bucks, obviously in the grand scheme of things isn't a grant in, in a ton of money, but it is interesting when you stop and think about how we view income coming in. And you've talked about this, the singles concept. Well, that's like a, a sacrifice bunt. <laughs> it's not even a single, but, but, but we talk about low hanging fruit, talk about getting into places, stuff like that. Um, I think that, that sometimes folks kind of limit where they can go. If you have the true, the, the skills to kind of navigate, to kind of talk, to negotiate, there's probably a lot of spaces you can actually be successful in. It's having someone letting you get in um, and validate you at that point of entry is really the key thing. And that's what it was for me with the fighting stuff. I wouldn't have been in it if this, someone else validated to me a certain fighter and that fighter who fought this weekend uh, gave me an opportunity. Absolutely. And to, to kind of come at this from a different angle that I don't think we've really talked about, and it's certainly not an area of expertise for me, so I can't talk at length about it. Maybe you, maybe you can and maybe you have more experience about it or you know, with this. But you keep in mind, you know, for the people listening – you know, we're talking about you know facilitating deal flow and facilitating quote unquote kind of offline and private market deals. Um, you know, there's a lot to be said for you know, some of, uh, my, many of the same concepts, if not all of the same concepts, can be applied to you know an Amazon dropship business or you know if you're if you're you know f- familiar with ClickFunnels. I mean, this is something that can be employed across a bunch of different things. And so you know in, in those different markets, kind of apply what you know the concept that we're talking about. But, it, but it's all the same thing. So, so I wanted to point that out because I think that we've been pretty consistent about talking about kind of at an overall theme, one style of deal. And these, these things are kind of, you know, these are universal. Yeah. And I think to that, you know, um, one of the things that, that I've kind of learned is, is that if you can understand uh, negotiations, if you can understand how to interact with people, how to read them, uh, if you can understand that, <clears throat> It, it can actually go from industry to industry to industry. The, the hard part, and what you have to be careful of, is is trying not to use the lingo till you know it. 
You know, that's that's kind of the thing you got to watch for. Because if you go from, you know, uh, like Ben, for instance, if he was to bring in maybe some of the lingo or talk uh, a one to one, it's kind of a hard analogy to make. But you know, throw out some terms that you might use commonly in a negotiation with mineral rights um, or, or minerals to a, to a fight promoter. They might, they might be like, "What are you talking about? I'm not worried about any of that stuff." You know, I'm not. I'm, but but at the high level, if you can understand how to read people, how to get the information that you're looking for out of them. And one of the things, Ben, I'll say, and I'm curious your thoughts. So with the fight business, um, one of the things I learned was the local regional fight promoter is worried about how many tickets can your fighter sell. That and, and That's the first thing, if, he, if he's a professional. The second thing is, can he bring any amateurs along because they don't pay the amateurs except for maybe travel or hotel. So if, you're, if you have a professional fighter, how many tickets can he sell, and does he have any amateurs to come with him? Once I know that, now I know how to negotiate with these fight promoters basically until the rules change. Um, but that comes from being able to listen to people, ask the right questions, probe for information, why don't you want him on this card, whatever the thing that, things may be. And that's, as you're saying, that works in a lot of different industries. That's just, that's just, talk about closing a deal, that's part of closing a deal is learning to develop those skills. So for me, one of the ways I learned to do that was I started going on sales meetings and I just kept being told the same thing over and over and over again um, by clients that they were frustrated with this, frustrated with that, looking for this. And I learned quite, quite early, uh, early on, if you just listen to what people are frustrated about, you could almost learn how to negotiate pretty quickly because you can, <laughs> you know, you can know what they're going to say. How, how did you learn that, that skill? I mean, I've read, I think Never Split the Difference is probably the best book on negotiating, in my opinion. But I've read books and business books, but but real world, practically, that's kind of how I've gone through this process. You said a lot there. Which process specifically? I want to I make sure I'm on point. Um, well, so my, my, my question, I guess, specifically is when I started, if I'm doing a deal on oil and gas, um, depending on what the deal is, I've learned how to listen, how to pull that information out. When I went to the fight business, I learned that I, I already knew how to do that. So I just deployed those tools. As you're saying, it works. How did you get the skill? Um, how did you hone that tool, if you will, to learn how to pull that information out and to deploy it in future negotiations or the current negotiations? Was it, uh, did you go to training? Was it kind of something that came natural? Was it books? What, what, or just being around the business and just listening to what people are saying? Did you have a mentor? I'm, I'm curious from your perspective. It's a, lot, it's a little bit of all four of those. Um, in addition to that, you know, I'm I'm always seeking out knowledge. I'm always trying to learn. I'm, you know, actually, before we we, uh, we uh, started recording the podcast, I've got uh, four or five different articles on on slurry injection wells up. Uh, I'm, I'm reading through that because that's something that uh, that has become more and more popular in the Permian Basin, and so that's something that, that I'm trying to make sure that I'm keeping on top of you know what's happening and what's new. Um, in addition to that, when I was first starting out, and this is something that I did even starting in undergrad, is you know I, I would message someone, you know, whether it be a LinkedIn or or what have you, uh, and ask for you know 15 minutes of their time and, and and say, listen, you know, I'm trying to get into the space, I'm trying to learn X, Y, and Z. I have, and then you know, have a couple, three specific questions. I have these questions. You know, can I take a little bit of your time to just, uh, you know, hear a little bit of your story and, and maybe we can talk through some of this. And, you know, the, the feedback that I got was overwhelmingly positive. I had a lot of great conversations. I had a lot of people that are probably, you know, at the time maybe didn't deserve their time or, or you may, maybe you, I just framed it in the way that they wanted to help. And, and I think that's something else. I mean, you, know, you and I have talked about this offline quite a bit, but I think there's there's a quite there's quite a bit of an appetite for people in the industry to help others, but you have to know, well, you know when and how to approach it. You know, it's not a selfish, you know, tell me everything you know. You, you have to kind of, you got to do it the right way. But but I think, you know, to a degree, I think a lot of, you know, what's lacking in some networks is just simply people don't share information nearly as freely as I think they should. And I think it's really valuable. Um, you know, and people will be willing to help you if you reach out and if your intentions are, you know, are right. So. Okay. So let's move on then, unless you got anything else on that. How do you, because you are, um, I, the company that I, that I own is, is, uh, it's a completely different business model than what you have. So we have, uh, depending on the time of year, you know, 30 to 50 employees because they're, we're a service company doing a lot of service things. Um, you don't have that, which is nothing wrong. It's not a criticism one way or another. It's just different businesses. So we talked about this a little bit last week about, you know, I think we're talking about an administrative assistant. Um, from your standpoint, is more of a kind of a solo operator. 
Um, how do you delegate? You know, when do you bring someone in? Um, how do you negotiate those terms? Because obviously, if it's administrative assistant, it's probably more like a contract or per hour basis. But if you're trying to say bring in a geologist, you might be trying to negotiate a deal with them. How do you look at it and say, you know, this is something I want to pass off? Or how do you look at it and say, this is something no, I, I want to handle myself? Definite weakness of mine. I'll admit it live on air. Um, I, I don't delegate tasks that I think that I can execute at a high level very well. And what I mean by that is there's a lot of times where I take on a lot more work and I do it personally simply because I have a, and I'll freely admit, I have an exacting standard and I have a very, very, very high level standard for due diligence work, uh, whether that be, you know, formatting or, or, you know, how it's presented, how the information is, is, uh, you know, is torn through. And so there's a lot of times where I'll do a lot more you know, than I quote unquote should, but that's just something that, you know, that, that I navigate around. Um, outside of that, I do have a, a pretty vast network of contractors that, that I contract out to, and I have you know, varying uh, levels of, of relationships with. Uh, what I'm looking for, or what I look for mostly is, and I think I put something on LinkedIn maybe about six weeks ago, uh, looking for, for some additional people, and I, and I got a number of responses. I'm looking for somebody that's comfortable working, not necessarily all for, but you know, if he's comfortable working for upside, comfortable working for equity. And the reason I look for that on the front end is because what that tells me is that they think that their value that they're bringing is worth that. Because if somebody's coming to me and is just very hard line and I need a day rate you know, and that's it. That's not a negative at all. To, and it doesn't mean that I don't employ people or, you know, or contract people out like that, but that's, you know, that's not necessarily, if I had, you know, if I had to pick one or the other, I'm going to pick the person that's you know, comfortable working for equity only because again, that tells me that they're more comfortable in their work and, and, uh, you know, and what they're bringing to the table. Um, and again, that, that may be an unfair characterization. I'm not saying that that's blank and it costs everyone that, you know, that definitely speaks to my experience. Um, well, I, yeah, I, I guess I would ask, like, how do you, so you got to think about this. So you have your network now. And so the people that you know on various levels, and so it's a little bit easier, um, they, they have some level of trust with you, but when someone's coming in who doesn't know you, um, I, I understand what you're saying is there's a sense in which, Hey, um, you know, I, I can deliver, therefore being, I wanted to take the risk with you, but also how do you walk through it with the person who might be willing to do that, but they're like, you know, I don't really know Ben. How do I know Ben's going to come through? Is it you papering up with them? How do you maybe rest assure someone who's goes, you know what, Ben, I would love to do the backside stuff, but I, I really don't know you quite that well yet. Absolutely. Um, number one, we, we do have, you know, service agreements that, that address that. And, you know, all, all the compensation is clearly lined out. Um, in addition to that though, Ryan, you know, what I've found, and there are probably very few exceptions. Um, and again, this is something that I picked up in vector marketing, but I do, a, I do, I do all of my business now that I'm thinking about it. I don't, I can't think of an exception off the top of my head. I do all of my business with landmen that I've been referred to from people that I know personally that I have a relationship with that I trust wouldn't put me in front of somebody that they don't trust. And, and that that's, that's the vetting process for me. And so there, there have been times where I, some, you know, that I've been looking for someone and someone that I trust has referred somebody. I don't even interview that person. I simply send them a contract and say, review this. If you have any questions, let's talk. We, you know, then they, they, you know, then we have a conversation about, hey, this is what I'm looking for, and then without meeting them, you know, day two they're on a project because because I have that level of trust and that level of relationship with, with the person that brought me to them. You have a face like you want to say something. I'm curious. That's how you got stuck with me. I'm surprised you still use that method. I mean, you got to think the good <laughs> with the bad. I, I, it, you know, they're not they're not all wins. I, it, <laughs> Oh, I, I haven't given you a hard time this episode. You've been a little salty, so I've been trying to keep it, keep it, keep it in the fairway. So, if I had, it, but but it was just there. So, uh, I mean, no, but but we were but, together all week, like in person last week. So I feel like you know, I feel like we got to kind of dial it down. I mean, if if we keep going, I mean, like this just it's just too much. <laughs> I mean, as it is, I'm going to see you next week. You know, what is it in eight days in Houston? I mean, you know, is it that is it that soon already? It is. It is. Wow. <laughs> Closing in on a week. Wow. <laughs> By the oh. way, uh, just a, a quick plug. Uh, Ryan and I are going to be down in Houston for uh, summer NAEP. Unclear if we're actually going to be walking the floor, but we will be around downtown taking meetings, et cetera. And so if you want to uh, chat with us, uh, reach out to, uh, to Ryan or I, uh, and we will uh, work it out. Yeah, we'll be at the 1031 Exchange. Um, I can post that on my LinkedIn or send to Nate or something. We put the show notes. There's a breakfast, I think it is, a 1031 Exchange meeting. I don't know um, 
I don't know how many attendees they're expecting or how what their appetite is for. Yeah, attending. it may be closed. I don't know, but we can at least put it out there. It's it's you, you just got to sign up for it. And then there was something else. I don't know, but we'll we'll be posting on LinkedIn uh, the the events that we're at, or you can DM us offline, and we can tell you where we'll be um, as well. Okay, so no, no, that's good stuff. And, and you know, one of the things that you you said there was. You, you kind of had the you had this network of people that you, you you trust and you trust them and that that's you know that's pretty big of you I'm gonna be honest with you I'm gonna, I'm gonna, give, I'm gonna give you an edible here because I don't know anybody that I would say right now if they sent me someone that they said for me to hire this person that I would just send the contract I don't know anyone that I would say that about that, that anyone that I know on this earth that if they said Hey, you need to hire this guy. I would hire them sight unseen, and that's it. Blows me away that you you you're willing to do that. And I'm not knocking it. It's just like I can't I can't imagine ever not um, talking to the person myself, or if it was a you know depending on where it's at, you know having someone else I know talk to them. I, I can't imagine if they're gonna be interfacing with me directly. I can't imagine hiring them sight unseen. That's just mind boggling. So the way that I think about that is, and we could talk, we could, I mean, I could talk at podcast length about this, about the generic kind of interview process that you go through at normal companies. I think a lot of that process is completely worthless. I think that that's a waste of time. And so the way I look at it is that, again, going back to my exacting standard, you know, when I say that I get, that I'm, you know, happy to give someone work and have them do it, you know, sight unseen or without developing that relationship first, that doesn't mean that I'm not, you know, that I don't have the same level of standard. And so I very quickly can vet somebody out if they don't meet that standard. Right. And so I'm, I'm happy to give them one project and take it as a business loss, you know, just as an expense on my own, if they happen to mess it up so badly that it's irreparable. But, you know, for, for my workload and for what I'm looking to do, I'm willing to put you in the building and I'm willing to let you prove yourself or not you prove yourself worth it or not one way or the other, because that's no skin off my back. Because if you prove yourself, I can, I'm going to continue to bring you work. If you mess up the first one, I've got, I've got a very sh- short leash and I'm going to cut you. Whereas if I was looking to like hire somebody and I went through an interview process and all those things, you're investing a lot of time in that person. And then if you're training that person, that's even more time. And, and I think that a lot of times, and again, you know, this is something that we could talk about offline or at length. A lot of times companies, you know, you'll find employees or, or, or contractors even that are there for the long term or there for a long time only because they're like so entrenched in the process it's like it's hard to pull them out and you've given up so much resources to like train them to do what they're doing that it's, it's hard to divorce yourself. Whereas I, I like to have the relationship be a lot more fluid in the sense that, you know, I can very quickly, and I think you and I are probably similar in this sense, I can very quickly figure out if somebody's going to cut it or not, whether that be, you know, they can't move the pace that I'm moving at. You right. know? And, and, I mean, there's a number of people that, that I've worked with in the past that do phenomenal work. But the pace just the pace and the workflow just didn't marry up, and, you, and so you just kind of have to find the sweet spot. But it works a lot better for me because you know you asked me last week if, if I wanted to do something, and I think my answer was absolutely not. I have no interest in being you know a manager. That that's that's not my you know, that's not my fairway. And so to that point, you know I don't have any interest in having a number of employees that I would have to you know, oversee on a day to day operation at this current time in my business, because that's just not what fits best with my workflow and with what I'm trying to achieve. Interesting. I guess for me, I, um, the people that I do work with, um, is a pretty small group that I have to interface with. And so when I'm thinking of this, it's, you know, um, obviously working stuff with you and a handful of other people and those people I'm in contact with pretty regularly. Um, so when I'm thinking about this, I'm thinking, okay, I'm gonna be in contact with this person pretty regularly. Um, I'm not so, sure. It may be, maybe we're talking about one to one, and that could be part of the, the, the thing here. But go no, ahead. So, let me no, let me flip it around for you because something that you said to me last week really struck me, and I think it's the same just on the other side of the coin. Um, you uh, we were you were working on something, and you know there was some, there was a point of contact at the vent uh, at the vendor, and uh, you know, for what for whatever reason you weren't familiar with him, you didn't know his name. You, that was something you were totally divorced from, and I find that fascinating because for for me, I wouldn't be able to do that. And it's because you're delegating so much task and responsibility off to someone that is sight unseen from you that you know, the, the, uh, keep in mind. And I'll say this for the listeners, um, you know, in my workflow, even the stuff that I don't do, 
I'm still touching everything. So if somebody sends me a title report or someone sends me something, I'm still touching it because I'm looking through it to make sure that it meets my standards and then it goes out the door. And so, but you have, you have a model where you have people that you have entrusted to take the full stack of work and give you reports when necessary, but not involve you in, in any of that, that day-to-day process flow. And I find that fascinating because that, again, going back to what I said when we started this question, that's a weakness of mine because that's not something that I would be comfortable doing in my current model. Yeah. Okay. Well, I would love to explore this more. I don't know if we're going to have uh, time on this episode, but no, it's definitely something we need to put a put a pin in, as they say, and explore it because I, I'm curious. I'm always curious why people like you think like you think, and you're probably curious why I think like I think. So, so it's, it's you know, probably of, make, not just well, about that. About, okay. about a lot of I, things. Uh, okay. Well, okay. Fair, fair enough. Fair enough. But no, it, it is interesting because um, you know I. Uh, the short answer is, um, I can give you an example. We were working for Chesapeake uh, back in the Haynesville Shell days. And at the time, we had um, four, we kind of, at Archer Global, we kind of measure things on survey crews. We had 14 survey crews running uh, for Chesapeake. And we had two meetings, one on Tuesday, one on Thursday, and they would go all day, literally all day. So my week would be first half of Monday. I was kind of getting my head wrapped around stuff. Second half of Monday was prepping for Tuesday meeting. Tuesday, all day meeting, not being not being facetious, all day meeting. Wednesday, come back, debrief the first half uh, Tuesday meeting for the first half of Wednesday. Second half of Wednesday meeting, I would brief for Thursday's meeting. Go Thursday, come back Friday, try to catch a breather, catch up, and then Saturday would you know catch up on stuff and then r- r- rinse repeat. And I could keep up with all of that. It was not a problem for me. And then one day we got behind on some plats, and I stopped. And I started to get in the weeds in the plant. And they called me and they said, hey, what's going on here? And in those two or three hours, I had been working on that one problem. Emails, things. Pro- and I realized at that moment that you can be in the weeds or you can be out of the weeds. But to fluctuate in and out is a very, very hard thing to do. And I'm not saying you can't do it. I'm saying that for me, I could handle a lot of information at a high level, move pieces, direct, push things. Um, you know, bring this in, send this out, spitball this, let's think about this, what's going on here. That's very easy for me. But if I get in the weeds and I got to come out, I, I could have lost potentially what was going on because of, of various things. So I'm going to say it's a weakness. I don't know. It's just that that moment. And so what I, what I told my team was, I said, hey, I can't do this anymore because if I do this, literally the email is just going insane. There's things that are just changing so much. Um, and so I've really tried to keep that model now if i'm working so if i'm working on a project or a deal i kind of want to be at a certain level that allows me to kind of watch things help steer help guide help direct um but i can get lost in 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 the minutia very easily and the next thing you know i have i come out of it and i don't know what's going on in the world so that's i don't know maybe you said it's a weakness i don't know i'm curious your thoughts on that no, absolutely. And that's that's super valuable. What I would say to that, and it's probably a generic answer and, and, and may not be wholly accurate, um, but I probably I probably make up uh, for that by just working those extra hours you know, and going back to the fact that, you know, you know, I think you really and it sounds it sounds how it sounds. But, I mean, you know, if I have you know no girlfriend or wife and no kids, you know, that frees up how many hours a week of my time, right? And so my focus is my business. And so I probably just take that offload work that I could delegate to somebody for working 40, 60 hours a week and I do it myself. Um, but I'm also more efficient than, than someone that I'd be delegating to, right? And so if somebody else is spending 60, I'm probably only having to spend 30. Um, but it's just, it's just one of the, like you said, right. it's a business decision that I've made. It's, it's, not, it's not a right or wrong. Right, and, and we, we should be clear here. The, the difference would be is the example that you're giving is on something that's having uh, on that particular thing. You know, I've got a couple of salespeople that work for me, uh, project manager, director. I've got a lot of people with a lot of moving parts on a lot of different projects for a lot of different clients. And so it would be almost impossible for me to sit down and manage all of those people at a very tight level. I need, I need the, the, these, these are only the handful of people that I really trust. Like I said a minute ago, it's not everyone that gets this responsibility. It's a handful of people that I really trust. And those are the people who I know that they kind of think like I think, they kind of do things like I want to do. And therefore, I don't feel like there's, they have skill sets that I don't have and I have weaknesses they don't have. But but I also feel like it's part of an extension of me, if you will, than it's just some separate person. 
But also, I mean, you know, at a very core level, at a very base level, you have an, a business model that if implores you and, and necessitates employees. I don't. And so, I mean, that's, yes. that's also something. I mean, you know, you, you would not be able to do what you do without employees, whereas, you know, while it may stem exactly. the tide sometimes and I may go slower at times, it's not a necessity for me to have. No, 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 no. It, no that's a very important. So for, for those types of things, it's definitely a necessity. I wouldn't deal with that business if I if I had to do it all myself, it just wouldn't, it wouldn't be lucrative. It wouldn't be worth my time. It wouldn't be, you know, it wouldn't be things. So no, there's, there's definitely differences. Um, I think one of the things on the show, we, on this episode, we kind of talked about is, and I hope that it comes across to the listeners is we're trying to give you the spectrum here of, uh, of things that are going on, how do things work? How do we see things? We don't have to agree on everything. There's not always a right and there's a wrong. There, there's just a lot of different moving parts in, Sometimes stepping back and, and realizing where you fit in that process, if you have a mentality like Ben does, where you really want to get in the weeds and you really want to do it yourself and you really want to grind it, then, then you want to go and you want to do that. Don't let that hinder you um, by trying to do things maybe a little more like I do, or if you're more like me, may, or somewhere in the middle, or not like any of us. I think that's kind of the thing. And, and today, Ben, we've had it at least once or twice. We said it again, it gets so old for me when everyone says this is the way to do it. It's like, well, that's your way to do it. And, and 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 so good for you. My my kind of rule of business books is I listen to a business book, and then most people don't have the same person that I do. They're writing these books, so I take ten to fifteen percent of what they say. Uh, that kind of aligns with my personality. It's okay. This is actionable for me. The rest, okay, maybe it's great for someone else, but for me, it doesn't work. I would go as far as to say that it's possible that somebody could listen to all six of these episodes and, and listen and continue to listen and do everything in opposite of what we talked about and still find success. I mean, there, there's not. There's not one model to, to do this. There's not one way to put this together. No, definitely not. Definitely not. Okay, well, we are up against the clock here. I know we loosely talked about a guest next week. Do we have one that you know? I don't have one booked. We might have one booked, but do you have one booked before we say we're still waiting to hear, or do we know yet? Well, we don't have one booked yet. We're still waiting to hear. Um, okay. It may need to be the week after, Nate, still, still haven't been able to confirm. But. Sure. Okay, so we will have some more guests um, coming on, and we haven't really figured out the formula for the show. We're still early on, so it'll be kind of a work in progress. Sometimes be me and Ben, sometimes Ben and a guest, uh, me, me, me Ben, and a, ben, ben and I and a guest, or however you say all that. And so uh, we're working through that. Um, go ahead, Ben. So one thing I wanted to mention, um, anybody that's listening that's connected with Ryan and I on LinkedIn, um, if you could come to my defense on these posts, it's kind of, it's getting, I feel, I feel attacked. I mean, literally, actually, I mean, literally, um, but uh, uh, you know, if you might, if, if you, if you want to throw me a bone, just kind of like tell Ryan that he needs to, he needs to lay off. You know, I, I would appreciate that. Um, that's my only pitch for today. That's all I get. <laughs> I will, I will back you publicly. If you will tell them how you treat me privately. <laughs> I, I'm, I'm sorry. There's a back. Yeah. I, I I, I'm sorry. I'm, what? Yeah, I'm like the abuse victim who's just lashing out for help. That's all. This is my cry for help. The, the audio is cutting out. I, I can't. I don't. I'm sorry, uh, Nate. You got to work on the, the yeah, audio. Yeah, Nate's got to work on that. Oh boy. <laughs> uh, speaking of LinkedIn, late Nate will put our LinkedIn's in the show notes. Bringingtheclosures.com is the website. There is a number there. You can text us a question or leave us a voicemail. Ben. Anything else before we get out here today? I know I'll be in Houston the next two weeks, uh, and maybe we'll be in Colorado together at some point later this month. We're it's TBD on that, but uh, we'll be at Nape for sure next week, or in and around Nape, or whatever. We'll be in Houston, um, wheeling and dealing. I didn't even know you were following me up here. Uh, that, that's I feel like three three weeks out of four is too many. I feel like we should we need to have a conversation because um, I'm seeing you like three weeks after that. Anyways, this this is it's it's, it's moving along too quick. Um, Three weeks yeah. after, uh, yeah, last week, last weekend in September, or, so, or like third weekend in September, unless you're bailing on me, we've got plans for 24, 25, 26 in Dallas. I can spill the beans on there. Oh, you like. oh, oh, oh! I'm looking at my calendar now. Yes, yes, we do. Yes, wow. we do. Wow. Yes, we do. Well, okay, never mind. I thought we were seeing each other, but never mind. <laughs> we do. 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 So, you see, oh, you good see, lord! You see how you see how it is, people. You see how it is. Okay. LinkedIn, bringingtheclosures.com, website, text, voicemail, questions, comments, concerns, ratings, reviews, all of that great stuff. And Ben, what are you going to do this week, man? You going to close the deal? 
we are we're going to close the deal this week. Yes, sir. All right. All right. Thank you, listeners, for tuning in, and we'll talk to you next time.